Oh, fantastic! Yeah, on on that on that note, let's uh, let's get started, hey? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> well, hi there, and welcome to another webinar uh, where we are thinking about church together. Uh, at Thinking Church, we exist to help your church thrive, and we hope that this webinar helps your church do just that. Uh, my name is Chris, uh, and I'll be hosting this webinar uh, along with my good friend Lee Button. Hi, Lee. Hi. Thank you. Nice to be here again. Excellent, excellent. Uh, and it's also a great pleasure to have our special guest, Lorne Campbell from Church Office. Hi, Lorne. It is great to see you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. And it's Fantastic. worth saying at this moment in time, you, you have a magnificently wood panelled room. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just the background. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> so Lorne Lorne is joining us today from uh BPG uh where Lorne serves as senior partner um and part of his responsibility there as senior partner is he oversees uh some outsourced functions uh under the banner of church office and charity office providing outsourced solutions and some back office functions for churches and charities of all sizes um everything from looking at some of the ops and the governance side of things and what that means in terms of hr and health and safety through to overseeing uh bid writing and fundraising programs that we run for a number of clients and for those of you who've contacted thinking church previously and spoke with chris and i you know that uh actually there this is a sister organization to us and as part of that when you've talked to us about governance and things specific to church and operating in your context it's likely to have been uh, Lorne or one of the other partners, Stephen, who you will have spoken to about actually taking action on all of that. So it's great to have uh, Lorne in here today um, as, as a friend of ours, uh, but also as part of the, uh, uh, the wider team about what we've got going on here. So uh, thanks again for joining us. We're looking forward to getting started today. What a great introduction. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's uh, worth saying also that if you are watching this back on YouTube, uh, please do hit that uh, subscribe button and give us a like too. It will help us reach more people with our content who are thinking through some of the big, uh, big topics of church life. Uh, Lee, why don't you tell us about what we are going to be talking about today? Okay, so some of you will have noticed that uh, we've, been, we've been running this as a series about going online. And then uh, with today's one, you'll have seen that it actually changed name because it was going online, getting back in the building. Uh, but we've changed it now to post lockdown as we actually start to look about what steps are going to be taken uh, within, uh, well, everywhere internationally uh, to lift lockdown measures and allow some freedom uh, back with how we operate in uh, our, our buildings that we have and our office spaces and what that means in terms of work and gathering. And to the extent that maybe uh, any of us have been affected, but specifically, Churches have uh, some unique angles when it comes to moving beyond the lockdown period. We do have office space of which we're going to invite back staff and volunteers, as well as the congregational spaces where maybe we conduct our services and programmes through to maybe hired space and shared space and what that might look like with our other activities that we do. So there's an awful lot uh, to consider and every church has a unique context we can't mitigate for every building type and style um it's like they are they are also unique and varying age and different complications that maybe come with that so actually as chris has said this is about thinking this is about what goes into the process behind the decisions uh so that actually there's some application there to help kick start you on your journey today um as we look over what this next month two months three months will look like and that steady ramp up as to how we can put things in place, work on our policies and procedures, and actually make sure that we steward our resources well, but also keep a safe environment for all of those that we engage throughout the week. Excellent stuff. Um, Lee, kick us off. Let's kick off with the first question. Um, I'll go over to you and uh, let's, let's start pummeling Lawn with some good questions. It's worth actually saying as well, um, if you're if you're watching this, listening to this, um, and you have a question, um, we have a Q and A section on the webinar, and so um, if you've got a question, we'd love to be able to answer it for you, or uh, probably not us answer it for you, get Lawn to answer it for you. Um, so just drop it in the Q and A section, and we will uh, make sure that we get to it uh, if we've got enough time. Uh, Lee, kick us off with some some questions. Okay, great. Um, as I just touched on, then there 
there's two aspects really to what this means in terms of church uh, going back into our buildings. There's two aspects of it. We have, uh, for some, it'll be the staffing option, and what it looks like to reopen an office space and have people stop working from home potentially as to gathering again. And then we've also got the opening up the larger spaces that we have for the more congregational aspects of what we deliver in terms of service, program, maybe even rental to the community um, in some situations. So, Lord, as, as we approach that, is this, can we, can we have one plan or is this actually two things that we should be looking at? And what does it mean to develop a plan um, around reopening? So just two first things I'd say straight away. The first one is that uh, um, follow government guidance and the, what they're saying at the moment. So obviously there's something coming up this weekend. Listen to that. The second thing is start gathering your thoughts. So this is why we're doing this web webinar now, um, to gather your thoughts on it. So um, for, for me, going into the building, you, you, it's, it is one thing with several parts to it. So the first thing is, if you're going to access the building again, it's how do you open it up safely and how do you communicate that? And more than likely, it's going to be your staff that's going to be the first guys in. Um, so it's trying to think through what they need to be doing uh, and accessing. And obviously all you guys know your buildings much better than I do. Um, uh, but it's, it's the staff and then it's saying, how do other people start to access it? Yeah, I, I can obviously go on a little bit more than this, but uh, I'm trying to make sure I don't over answer a question. No, that's fine. So when it comes to say, let's start with the, the office aspect and what yep. that might mean. Uh, our, our teams in terms of, uh, of that, adequately have probably been working at home in a in you know reasonably well as well as juggling education uh potential child care and other things that go with it as as we open up and put our offices back into practice often not in the same place as the as the gathering spaces sometimes within that larger building and part of the bigger thing what's what's one of the fundamentals we should consider in our thinking first with returning staff to the office the big thing is, is communication with the staff team. They, whether, whether we've done remote working or you've furloughed the guys, uh, they will have developed some form of rhythm. So it's communicating with them, talking to them about what the changes are, engaging with them to make sure they're on board. There will be some nervousness. Uh, depends on everybody's got a different kind of a situation they're in. There will be some nervousness to going back to what was a public building, even if it was an office space. It's still, there'll still be some anxiety. And within that communication, you're able to find out exactly where they're from. Some may not be able to return uh, to, to work because of childcare facilities or options and that kind of thing. But um, the thing for me is you, you, you communication. Second thing then is ensuring that someone goes on site and having a look around uh, and, bait and checking whether there's vermin got in, has there been any damage done because of natural, natural rain or other things, has there been any vandalism? Um, uh, and then, then within that is, is deciding whether what sort of deep clean you need for it. Um, so communication, the, the, the access to the building, the cleaning of it, um, and then within that is to think through, if we're to open this up, how would I maintain uh, following government guys, governance guidance, which currently is maintain two metres, um, uh, have one-way systems and that kind of thing. How would I do that in the building? Um, so it's, it's kind of those three things to start with. I think there's a very important one there is actually the pace at which things will reopen and have service brought back in, particularly around schools opening up and other uh, nurseries and preschools, is that they might not happen at the same time as our office space, as you just said. So actually, uh, where, where does that touch on with, um, we, might be con we might be continuing with virtual communication for a bit longer, um as not all school years will probably go back at the same time so we might have staff who have to juggle those responsibilities what is there something there we need to look out for um on the hr side and the policies for like work from home and the flexibility that might come in how, how do we continue to build that well so the challenge is is that within health and safety where people are working at home there should be desk assessments done and there should be certain things uh, encountered and certainly with um, with law long term things they then need to be having keyboards and screens and other bits and pieces so this is some of the challenges when do you draw a line and say we've actually got to accept that some of our staff are going to be working at home longer term uh, suitable chairs and that kind of thing mm. um, the other side of that is is to engage with them if they are on furlough what's the terms um, so there is that you're absolutely right there is a HR piece about but if you frame that around communication and you're talking to them um, you, you, you're able to pick that up within, within that. But 
if they stay at home for longer, you do then need to start thinking about longer impact of um, how long are they on the computer? Uh, are they stage protecting correctly? Um, uh, and those kind of things. Yeah, so that's where it starts to impact deeper into other, other practices that we should have within our policies and procedures as yeah, working roles and responsibilities, the expectations that we place on individuals, but also, like you said, like data protection and those aspects about people who are doing uh, what, I mean, we're not at a point at the minute where we're gathering cash offerings or anything and doing banking uh, per se, but the data that is associated with giving and stuff is probably still passing around in other environments that actually we, we might need to take account of in terms of that yeah. risk assessing. So it's one of those things, if, if you were to stop and say, what happens in a normal working week or month uh, of, of things that in, a, in, a, in your church office uh, and think, well, that's normally happens, just listen down and then go, how is that impacted with what we're doing now? Some of this stuff you've just naturally kind of figured out because um, you've, necessity has mandated it. But if you actually now stop and think intentionally about it, you can say, well, some of these things now need to be intentionally done or we need to change our, our policies, or we need to do an, end, an end, addendum to it so that you do a temporary fix. Um, because you, the lockdown is becoming longer, um, and the HR, whilst you can, you can have a grey area because it's different, that can't go on forever, and you, you've got to define it. And it certainly like seems... holiday sick leave okay. is another thing. Mm. I was going to say, it certainly seems to me that with churches looking at opening their offices, and it looks like that could well be a good few weeks before the church auditoriums open up and if we've got to maintain two meter gaps most church offices that i've been in tend to be pretty small um yeah. and so how you can do that when you've got two or three staff that are normally in a very very enclosed space it might be that you have to think about relocating your office space within the building you know if you're on if you're on site on a church it could be moving into your auditorium for instance and then hopefully having enough Wi-Fi to be able to, to run, but it'll be those kind of things that we're, we're, we're thinking so, about. So, so on that, it, it, you have to think through the whole line of that. So for example, if you are gonna, you, you, it's worth saying that even during this lockdown, it is acceptable for you to visit your church, church building once or twice a week, because there are certain maintenance things that you should check on uh, and certain issues, certainly with larger buildings, um, yeah. it would obviously be much worse if it was uh, winter or something with frozen pipes etc but it is acceptable if a police officer stops you it is acceptable for you to say I'm going to this premises to check that it's okay um, now obviously don't stay there for hours and all that sort of thing but it is acceptable for you to go there go through everything check it through um, so going back to the line kind of idea uh, you go in they say the normal office is normally fine for two people but it's far too small you can't do your two distance two meter distance at the moment so we'll put one in there we'll move someone somewhere else practically how are they going to access the building practically how are they going to have a desk that's appropriate how they have internet do you rely on ethernet, ethernet cables or is it wi-fi has the wi-fi been switched off has anyone checked it for the seven weeks does it still work um uh, you've then got to go and make sure that the heating's working okay and certain things that would would normally take for granted in a functioning office um is there right the way through to if they're there by themselves does your loan building policy, loan working policy, still work at the moment with the contact numbers? Are they somewhere mm. else now? You know, it's, it's thinking through from when they go to the building, how they operate in that building to when they leave the building, how does that work? And how would you mitigate um, them coming interaction with other people? Do you need to think about certain um, protective, uh, uh, personal protective uh, equipment and that kind of thing? And within that, it's to think it through as soon as possible because there is a supply chain issue with some of that. Yeah, so it is really st step by step thinking from, okay, when they come to the car park, when they go inside the front door and it's working through from every single step of the way and thinking about it, not just where are they gonna be sat? Because I think if you just go there, that's what only one aspect is what I'm kind of getting from it. We've got to think through, you know, before they get mm. in the building, has the building been maintained? Okay, now once they get in, where are they gonna enter? Is that going to be safe to enter, especially in terms of um, making sure it's safe, that it's secure, all those kind of things? Is they're the things we're going to need to, to think through. Yeah, and and it's it, things like your your um, your 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 alarm system. Um, so I would I would advocate you think through these things, you think about it, and you send someone uh, as an advanced party to check these things. Does the fire alarm still test? Do the uh, emergency lights still work? Or do you say we don't know about that? Therefore 
we've got a system we're only going to go in daylight hours and someone's we're going to call someone saying we're going when you leave the building we're going to leave the building or every every half an hour you're just going to send a message to someone saying i'm still here it's all okay it's just thinking through where the risk issues are and how you're going to mitigate them uh, it, it could be that you you haven't had cleaning for um for the entire period is it suitable to get a cleaner in um at certain points are you going to expect them to wipe down their surfaces every time they use it one of the big directives is do not share anything for even even pens bring your own pens use your own pens if you're using a hard surface make sure you wipe it down uh, when you arrive and wipe down when you leave that kind of thing so you've touched on something there uh, that kind of gave me uh, flashbacks to conversations we were having probably a year or more ago with churches relating to something a little bit uh, kind of like similar in terms of process but uh, a different aspect of, uh, of the life we have to do as organizations that was when we talked about GDPR which a lot of churches uh, got panicked about the scale of um, stepping up to implement GDPR as if it was this isolated thing for one moment in time. Whereas actually GDPR built effectively on top of data protection that should have been in place all the time. And actually then GDPR was a very simple uptick in what we were doing to cover off some new legislation. Cutting back now to this kind of like the, the, the way we're at when a lockdown and our buildings being shut. For some, this is going to seem like an awful lot of hoops to jump through to check that their building is okay, that everything's in place. It's going to actually probably rely on some policies and procedures that maybe weren't in place prior or checks now that we are saying that's a weekly check, that's a monthly check, that they're going, oh no, we've had seven weeks and nothing has happened. Or as we've seen in a number of the churches we work with, where they have an older population engaged because of the dynamic of their church, We've got people in those positions who are in their 70s, actually they're still self-isolating and actually aren't coming out to do any of those jobs. It seems a little bit like, oh, where do we begin? Are we in trouble? Look, what's an appropriate way to start if at this point we're realizing we haven't got those things in place? What's, what's, the, what's the first thing we should look at? What's the first step in that process if we've all of a sudden discovered we don't really have anything to help us do this? Yeah. Um, so like I say, the, the, the biggest thing is you guys know your building and you function in it. Some of, you, some, some of us don't have formal everything written down or maybe it hasn't been updated for a few years, but there is some form of start point, even if it is, I've gone to this church building for the last 20 years, um, I know some of the issues. It's then just going to say, okay, what, what is temperamental? What do I need to check? Obviously, more formally, there are fire, fire escape plans, there are plan maintenance there are electrical testing there's lift maintenance i mean that means just touching on that if you've got a lift don't expect it to work straight away it may mm. but it may get stuck and you don't want to have someone stuck in the lift the first time you use the building um uh, and that, 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 that those sorts of things but the first place to start is assess your building um and say what are the risks involved in that uh, and it, it could be the fact that it's um it's vulnerable from where it is so it could have some vandalism mm. it could be um, that you have water storage, so you, you might think no circulation for seven weeks. Where does that sit for Legionella? Do we need to do some testing on that? Um, it, it could be that we have a high population uh, over 70s. How are we going to help them access it? Uh, it could be that you run a mothers and toddlers group. Um, how are we going to make sure it's safe for the children to play there? If we can open at all, what's the process? So, so look at your building and then the second look at your activities. Um, and then with all within all that is follow the line think it through uh, as to how you, you, you develop um, so one thing I would say it's kind of there's, there's lots of things here one of the things we are doing is we're preparing a checklist for for people just to run through some of the stuff won't be so suitable for smaller buildings some of it will be but it's that kind of thing of okay what what makes this building work uh, and what do I need to check um, and ensure that um, it's been looked at on, on that note then, um, are, are you okay for us to uh, share that checklist um, with the guys that are attending today and make that available? We'll email that out afterwards? Yeah, yeah sure. But, uh, to, be, to be honest, it will probably send, it will be finished on Monday. Um, but yeah, that, that's fine. It'll be so close until Tuesday, that'll be fine. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, so uh, to, to give this kind of some time context, we're waiting to hear from our own government here in the UK about what the measures yeah. will look like. And uh, their deadline is today and they'll be announced on Sunday. Therefore, our measures won't really be fully known until Monday. So, yeah, Monday will be a good good point to kind of, you know, make sure this is on your agenda coming up. 
And touching back onto uh, going back into our buildings, there's, there's, there's a point there, having looked after some large church buildings myself in the past, you'll have routine testing. If you have a lift, there will be annual maintenance and scheduled maintenance. If you have boilers that are gas powered, you will have gas safety that needs to happen. And if you've got an even electrical testing that could potentially be due within this period because of how long the lockdown has been. Um, if we're going to open up safely, we need to consider as part of that, actually access to getting the relevant people in to come and carry out that testing to allow us to reopen. I'm imagining that after such a long period, seven, seven weeks, eight weeks, maybe more of people not doing that activity, that there's going to be quite a long lead time to get some of this. And so maybe we shouldn't be planning to just go, oh, the soonest we know we can open, we will open our doors. Actually, this needs to be planned opening. Just because they say we can open at X date, we might need to be planning for much longer after that as a result of getting things in place. Absolutely. Great. Chris, um, thinking through to the activities and the things that we, 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 we do as a church, what, what do you think to the um, which things to kind of like bring back and how to evaluate what we should be bringing back, especially as most people have got some online engagement going ahead at this minute um, and that the congregated space might be one of the more complicated things to do. Uh, wh where should we be looking at in processing and how to evaluate what we should or shouldn't bring back and when. Yeah, well, I think we've, we've all, uh, or majority of churches have seen the, the, the benefit of, of online services over the last few weeks and seen the benefit that it has in terms of uh, evangelism and people feeling like there's a comfortable space for them to engage with uh, a church service. So I think, I think that's really changed the the game a little bit in terms of how we think about church because I don't think anyone really had um, uh, fully grasped how effective online would be and so I think when we're thinking through what we're going to come back to I think we have to start from that place to, to understand that firstly the, the landscape's completely changed and so we can't go back just to what what was happening what was working beforehand because the world's a different place now and so I think uh, and especially now we're th thinking about well if buildings can open up and if it's you know if if the restrictions are opening up to say like germany where you can have church services but you've got to be two meters apart you're not actually allowed to sing those kind of uh things you may be thinking about okay let's take time before we rush to bring in in-person gatherings again let's look at what can we still achieve online but now um, whilst being able to utilize our space a little bit more or, or gather small amounts of people, what can we do where we can gather people? Maybe we might be able to gather people in, in homes a little bit more uh, where people can go around and, and, and be with family or, or, or slightly larger groups or with small groups of friends. So it's looking at, I think it's going to be, we're still in a long lead time before we can actually start to, to think about normality. And even in that case, I think online is now here to stay. And that is that uh, our, our greatest on-ramp for people attending church is online. And I think mm. that, that that's just not going to go away now. So I think we have to take everything with that prism. Like, like we're going to view it through that prism now, I think, that, that online is going to be the greatest way that people are going to uh, have that first step, that first encounter with church. So let's start from that place and let's work from there and actually go, okay, now what do we need to achieve or what do we need to do that's going to that that that's going to be in person that's going to be that next step that's going to help take people take it from there i think i think what we can't do is just go back to normal i think it's everything's going to go back to normal we have to start from that process and going okay we've we've gone back to going we've worked we're working quite well with just online only but now we've got the opportunity to bring new things on actually let's start from that on that place of online and work from there and i think that it's, it's starting from that place i think to begin with is probably going to be the most the most helpful yeah uh, i think that we've got that aspect of that we're seeing that in other sectors that the phased approach to reintroducing the kind of like the, the gathering even within like the workplace might mean that that timings are shifted and we, we might even see 
uh, kind of like, you know, in, in the short term, we're not going to really operate that nine to five aspect of what we do because there's going to probably be some staggering to make sure that we don't have uh, peaks, uh, just, you know, set times and cause congestion or this build up of people that actually what we're able to deliver as a church might actually be more able to flex to map now people's movements and, uh, and, and, and put things where, where they're at. Um, Lord, looking back at the uh, kind of like, you know, about, about gathering and social distancing, I mean, it might seem pretty obvious, but what, what, do, what, what is that impact on, on a space? If we were looking, you know, if we've got a church that's gathering 150 people at the minute in a room rated for 200, what what potentially could that mean what kind of thing do we need to be looking at so a, f a few things first of all is that if you know the size of your built your um, your hall that you're using um you will get guidance from the government about what the square footage is compared to how many people can have so a person's got to maintain a tw two meter squared um distance what does that look like within my building does my my 250 uh, or 200 uh room go down now down to 30 40 what does that look like the other point then is, so you, you then say, actually, there is going to be a capacity issue here. If we are going to go back, does it mean then we uh, run three services, for example, so that we can still meet the 150? Um, uh, obviously, the maths don't work on that quite, but um, uh, you, you get where I'm coming from is to say, what, what do we do differently? Or do we do, there's one that gather for a shorter time and we have other ones that um, meet somewhere else or, or um, do it on, online. Uh, the other thing to think about is pinch points is, Obviously, when you come into an entrance, there's you, the, whilst doors can be quite big, most places at most have a double entrance. Um, so therefore, there will be a pinch point where that you may not be able to maintain a two metre distance. So that's why a lot of people are saying, is, there, is it possible for you to run a one way system? Can you go in one side and come out the other way? What, 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 how can you work that? Um, so uh, do your, your ratio for the size of building, do your pinch points. The other thing is when you're sitting down, the, they're saying is actually remove the seating that you don't need so it's obvious where you've got to sit now obviously some of our churches more traditional do have queues which is fine um uh and uh some some churches have balconies so you've got to think through if i open this up how will i get how will i access this in a one-way system how will i leave it in a one-way system and within that how will if a fire happens or if an alarm goes off so that i need to evacuate the building how will i do that safely and then that goes into um, things like uh, communication um, and signage. One of the big things that they're doing commercially is that over the next few weeks, you'll see as you, if the lockdown starts lifting, you will see a lot of signage on 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 um, walls in windows. Mm. Or, or already you've seen that if you've gone shopping, but more and more that that will rule out, uh, and a lot of people will be using details on the floor. Um, but if you take Tesco's for example, when this first happened, there was more staff on the door communicating with customers as they came in potentially doing hand sanitizers you go in there yesterday or this morning there's not as many staff on the door it's because they've started they've trained them into that we followed that we're used to it so it's when you first start looking at opening the building you do need to rely heavily on having signage up and also staff there volunteers there stewards there whatever the vernacular is for you so that they can understand that and you need those guys to be fully understanding and fully equipped to deal with um, anything that could come up so Pinch points, how do you work that through? One-way system, ratios, fire safety, um, and then the other one is, is toilets. Toilets is an issue because quite a lot of ch churches say have three or four toilets, but it's often through one access point that is, again, unlikely to be two metres. Is it a, ca a case that you close the toilets for only those that, that, other than those that need it? What is the way to get to the toilets? I would recommend if you've got um, floor plans, uh, or even if you haven't got floor plans, uh, usually if you've got some form of fire escape um, uh, plan in place, you can grab those and draw on them. Just draw it out so you can see your floor plan and you can map through and you've got the measurements. Um, and that's why I say, if you're going to check the building, go and have a look around, take a make, take measure with you so you can start thinking these things through. So that you can say, no, do you know what? We're just going to close the end of that building off because we can't maintain it. Um, those kind of, it, yeah, so very, very practical there. Yeah. How, yeah, how is it going to work for things like welcome teams? I'm guessing we, we can't go back to high-fiving and hugging again. What are the things we're going to need to think through for, our, for, our, for those kind of welcome teams? So, great. So, first thing with it is the very practical, like I've gone through. The second thing is to then say, with all those things in place, how does that affect the activities or the, 
the, the vision and values we've got as an organizer, as, as a church, sorry, um, to then say, how can we reflect that? So you're, you're absolutely right. It could be, we can't do the hugs, but how can you show that in a, in a different way that is socially distancing, that is acceptable, that is accessible to people? Because, um, yeah, it, 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 it's dovetailing the practical of what you can do within the guidelines, your values, and then say, how can you express that? Is it a big smile? Is it, I don't know. I, I, I'm not the creative one here. I do the practical things, but it's 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 the hand and glove. Think very practically. Think about your values as a church, so you represent that. And how would you rep, how would you present that uh, in those mm. situations? But you're absolutely right. At this point in time, handshakes look look like a little bit of a distance, and certainly hugs are a little way off. Um, and I think that's it. It's actually in a lot of environments. If we went back to shopping centres, if we went back to some of our workplaces, that level of connectedness or kind of like being you know deeply personal or hugging one another maybe doesn't happen as much in some of those other places and spaces beyond people who are actually related to us whereas church actually it's it's often very familiar that the, the, the messaging and the key thing that we communicate has to be put across early and clearly to ensure that we don't just go in and there'll be that I imagine there'll be you'll feel a little bit like that overwhelmed the first time you go back into a space and there are bigger numbers again that it would be too easy to get close to one another and to, to kind of like you know have the hug or the high five so I think that we need to be making sure we're communicating that very early on one of the other things that I'd recommend and that's you know from from our from our thinking church perspective is get your teams together now before this happens in an online environment and chat it through and start thinking about what these aspects are. Some of those guys who've stood on the door and done the welcoming will already have deeper knowledge of what's actually to be considered than some of the people who are maybe you know leading in other areas of the church at yeah. this point. Get them involved and to kind of really open up and explore what this might look like and do it early so that you could have looked at all permutations. And then as you get given more information and we rely on data and we rely on instruction from like governing bodies and best practice coming into play, you can refine what those options were that your team came up with. So actually look to kind of like gather early and uh, communicate well and start thinking this through at a really, really early point. Because ultimately this is about us stewarding well there is the glory uh, you know we're doing all things for god's glory and we want to make sure that we're doing things in such a way that we instill safety in our community that we reduce fear that we reduce anxiety and we don't want it to be that uh, a jump back to doing things as we did them before actually makes people feel really cautious about entering our space if we've still got effective ways to minister and to meet people where they're at in an, in an environment that allows us to engage um, and to listen to them and to make sure that people are careful and looked after. So I think the thing is, is don't, don't go too early, but get your team involved as soon as possible so that we can really diverge all of our thinking and look at the biggest spread of options possible. Um, and some of our volunteers and the people hold some of that, what would seem like hidden knowledge, things that we do that we've always done that go undocumented now's the time to pick some of that up and work it into our policies and procedures and none of this is wasted either we've got the element of we so we, we as organizations would talk about having business continuity plans in place what to do in the event of disasters pandemics and things coming through now most of the time we don't experience it something at a global level but actually the ability to close down, not have use of your building and be able to disperse your services and know what to do. This is also worth documenting um, because you don't know about things like floods, fire, um, or anything that might happen in part of your building that could close it off and what you might have to do with entrances, exits, um, access to toilets and, and things like that. So it's worthwhile thinking while we're going through this whole process, actually preparing some level of business continuity alongside this so that we understand um, and that it's there documented because if that way if our if our physical knowledge in our head is not available at that time somebody else can pick it up and run with it um, and actually understand uh, where they are at sorry Chris you got anything to 
hint to add before well, we move I, along? I mean, I guess what I was thinking about on here is, you know, there are certain aspects of this where we can put our heads together and come up with some really good solutions. And I think that's just a, a brilliant idea, like get your team together and go, okay, you know, the old cliche is that necessity is the mother of creation. So it gives it gives all of our teams, you know, our welcome teams and worship teams and all these teams of how how can we find a new way of doing this in you know with social distancing rules and actually that's a really great creative exercise there are some things though that in my mind so if you think about serving refreshments there's probably going to be some of the things in terms of preparing drinks and things which might be outside of the skill set of people who normally do that kind of thing and how are we going to think through something where it is you know to that level of detail like preparing uh, food or preparing drinks that's going to be quite difficult if I mm. can uh, from an outside thought and so I mean Lord probably the best to come to you on this one well, How let's, we let's add in communion yeah well, yeah absolutely yeah so, so it's just, just taking a few steps back from that because I think the reality is getting to the point where you'll do refreshments or even do luncheons or something like that at a church building is is, is a long way off the, the, that's it's just the, the reality um, uh, there. So probably what I'd frame is um, is to start with, it, it, go back a little bit, just so we're of time, is, is the case that um, some questions to ask yourself, what could, go, what could have gone wrong with the building as a practical one? Um, how do I keep it clean? Um, uh, and that's things like regular cleaning with the touch points of if you're like pushing and open, closing doors, etc. cetera. Uh, how would I maintain social distancing within this building? Um, how does that, and this is where this comes in about the refreshments and stuff, how does that impact? So how do those three things or those two second, last two things, how does that impact the activities we want to provide or have uh, in the building? So whether that's services, whether that's office environment, whatever um, you provide in the building. Uh, and then how do I tell people? Um, so kind of those kind of, what's that, one, two, three, four, five questions would probably take you on a journey from where I am now to provide something, and you can you can cycle through that um, on, on different things uh, as uh, things become available. But the first thing is to check the building. The second thing is if staff's got to get in there and start using it, and then the third thing is if you're going to start running activities in there. But again, um, first question is what could have gone wrong with the building? Um, uh, like Lee said, if you've got a big, bigger building and it's up to scratch, you've probably got all these checks and balances in place. However, if a lift's been out of action for seven weeks, the chances are you probably do need an engineer to get it back into commission. Um, so it's worth then booking that supply chain for them to, to come in. There will be cleaning required, obviously, in a building, but what does that look like with the new COVID-19 regulations? And it's also within that, how can I offer peace of mind for other people off coming into the building? So it, mm. it could be that you do it visibly. Uh, things like hand sanitizer on entrance and, ent entrances and exit points um, spread out so that people can before they come in, they clean their hands. Before they leave, they clean their hands, um, uh, facilitating that. Um, uh, and then in the building, how do I maintain? Whether it's two meters, four meters, or it'll be reduced. And I would certainly encourage you, if possible, to look at moving furniture because then you can you can then uh, do two things. One is it's a natural thing is right. There are less chairs, therefore that's where I sit. The other thing is because you've done that, you you're able to maintain the distancing because you're not squeezing between rows uh, that may force someone to pass someone else so you've actually you control the environment and within that you work out your flow then you then go okay now I know what my canvas is like the activities I want to provide how can I do that within this canvas uh, and then how do I communicate that through signage through talking to people through emailing through messaging that kind of thing and all the things you touched on but that kind of just wrapping it together yeah and I think on 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 a, on a practical point about doing anything if you're reopening um, a building or if you are a building in you know certain um, uh, locations look during during this period of lockdown we've seen quite a lot of um, uh, economic things happen uh, people's salaries being cut rises with some levels of unemployment um, even people you know like the furlough thing it's great that we're able to keep things kind of like moving but things can get uh, a lot tighter when it comes to having buildings in place again, and particularly with the role of the church or even any public space, what do we do with kind of uh, the levels of, we, we suddenly become this place where uh, people, that people can go again, 
Uh, we've got the practical things. We're going to try and, you know, get, get stock in. Um, we've seen levels of like, you know, hand sanitizer and the, these kind of things that, that we, that we put in place. There are also things that can go missing. Uh, we've got the security aspect of what we've got going on. Um, it's, you know, we see, we see rising this moment anywhere in, in our newspapers, we're seeing as things reopen that, you know, little, little, little spates of things, uh, um, happening on a security point of view. So it's just worth building in as well. Like actually, how do we, how do we look after our, you know, our, our setup, our pack down, and what things do we have in place? What things do we store on site? Um, and practically, how do we secure things? Because it's uh, we've got we've got to make sure that level of safety covers all aspects of uh, of how we're operating. I'm just going to pick up on. Um, we've actually had a question come in uh, uh, from uh, Stephen, who's attending today. Thank you very much for that. So the question actually is around: um, if the goal is to go back like it was before, what is the new win? Um, but actually pushing on from that uh, a little bit and, and maybe say actually as part of your process as you define what the future looks like and what what this is going to be how do you define uh the new win so that you know what you're what you're working towards um chris what what can we do with kind of like helping define that yeah so i think firstly um i think the goal isn't to get back to what it was before i think we'd, we'd miss out on on something very significant if that was uh, always the case um, but I think what we can start to do is go okay let's let's start from at the very beginning with what the win is because if we define the win as the mission of our church the mission should hopefully stay the same regardless of the circumstances that we're in however our method will change so in, in, in that sense our method to achieve the win will completely change but I think that actually our win of what we're aiming to do, and especially when we're thinking about uh, our services being part of a, a discipleship pathway uh, and about how they are existing to help people grow in their relationship with Christ, they may not change. Um, but it could be that the way that we achieve that will change. And especially with online services now, I think that, and especially how, uh, how we staff our churches and how we think about the utilizing online. You know, we've got this situation now where we've got every church has become an online church over, you know, it was basically overnight that they became that. And soon enough, we're going to go back to when buildings open again, then people go back, you know, church pastors go back to their old jobs, but this need for online still remains. And so we've got this gap that's already going to exist really, really soon. So we can't, but, but the need is still there. We've, yeah. the need is undeniable for, for, for online. So we've got to think about uh, moving forward, in, you know, moving forward to go back to, uh, uh, so we can't go back to what it was, uh, but we will want to open our buildings again, but we are going to have to think through very, very um, significantly how we think about online, how that's affecting how we staff our church. I think that they're, they're really big thoughts. But in terms of the new win, I think that there may not necessarily in terms of that way be a new win, but I think online does shift that because I think it brings it into that whole concept about uh, people engaging before with church before coming and attending. So it will change things completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, picking up a couple of other questions that have come in, um, asking about thoughts on children, teenagers, young people uh, coming in and attending their groups and the facilitation of that, because um, we probably all know how well children will socially distance. Uh, um, Lorne, Lorne what, where would we be looking for kind of like guidance and the practicalities uh, when it comes to like the children's stuff? So the, the government will issue, which from my understanding, the government will issue some direction on that. Um, the challenge we've got is we will have to be looking at what schools do um and what schools can do may not be what we can match so it, it's yeah. an interesting thing to, to, to monitor um some of the thoughts coming out at the moment is, and it, it, it's an ongoing conversation okay um we we've got different buildings we've got to look at what we can do the, the chances of running school uh, um, children's work in the way that we've done it in the past for the first phased opening is probably unlikely so it will probably more likely you'd be thinking about how this church service I offer now, what does that look like? So it engages with the, the 
for, for the congregation that, that's before me. So it could be that, and actually some of this stuff will be, you might not want to do the, you might do a long, a shorter service um, uh, and the values that you're trying to present at that, that, at that gathering may not be um, the way you'd run your church in uh, X number of months ago. So you just need to think through, and that's why you need to think about your furniture because you might then go, one of the one of the things that someone was talking about, and we we're spitballing this, is would you would you run in a kind of Eventbrite system where you say we can only fit 40 people in, we've got three services, uh, therefore these times, these times, these times. You then got an opportunity. Do you run the same service three times? Do you have three different people, three different setups and, and runs, or what does it look like? Uh, those and obviously there's loads of questions about practicalities there, but you go online, you book the slot you want to go to, you book the kind of things that they, so for example, myself, if I went, there'd be six of us going uh, because there's my wife, my own four kids. Now we're all living together. So technically we can all sit together. So if we knew that we could set that up again, practicalities aside, um, you can you can start looking at those sorts of things. Um, uh, but, so that's just an example of saying, right, we're gonna run a short service. We're gonna run an on all age one. And um, we recognize we're going from a 180 um, size church to only being able to sit 40, this is how we're going to do it. Because there's this number of families, we've got a one-way system that we can go up the stairs, we go out the back, go down uh, and out through the, the meeting point area. So therefore, we're going to ask families of more than two, two, four or more are going to sit in the pews upstairs and they, they will be allocated when they come in. It's, it, I know it's practical in thinking these things through, but it's, it's that kind of, I know my building, I know my church, how can I use technology uh, and engagement to do that? Accepting that not everybody has access to technology and we might need to have other options but then you can say those who mm. don't have it we we set aside an area so that we know they're coming and we can plug them in there um, but more people now have some form of a mobile device than they have computers so they there is an accessibility potential as long as you figure out how you can get again rolling back to that idea what's your canvas how are you going to communicate it to get people in and using it and functioning uh, within that no, um, and then just I'm sorry to say one sorry. more thing is that it's an opportunity is just because your building's laid out, okay, structurally is a challenge, but just because your building has a natural flow at the moment, doesn't mean you could change, you can't, you, you can't change that. So if you were to say, we normally face this way, what would happen if you face that way? Um, uh, to, to think outside the box. Sorry, Chris. I, I, yeah, and it's worth saying on that one, you know, even though a family might be able to attend, you know, my family, I've got two children who are, I've got a two-year-old and a five-year-old, and uh, their knowledge of being able to keep so keeping socially distanced from other people attending that service is going to be almost impossible. So I think pushing into to online online is not just a uh, a nice to have or a must have because we're in social distancing. Is actually even in this in this intervening period thinking about how we can continue to develop our online services because it may be actually right for a family like mine to stay uh, at home and, and do online services for a few more months until those measures yeah. are reduced. And actually thinking, how can we still provide great value in, mm. uh, for, for people who are uh, you know, attending online and not thinking of them as, you know, they, they're, they're not real attenders, uh, but yeah, actually let's provide them something that's really great in this time. I think that's yeah. an excellent point. Uh, and yeah, I'm definitely gonna pick that up in other things that I'm talking about is this idea that attending church on a Sunday in a building isn't the be all and end all. You can attend church online on a Tuesday. I think, you know, using that a little bit more to say, I am accept, uh, accessing church. And you just, you can define that in your, in your context, but you, it is acceptable to do an online contact. Um, and obviously we, there are human contacts and stuff that we need to look through and accept, but the idea of church attendance uh, as, as something is, it, it is as valid online uh, as it is face to face within a church building yeah absolutely yeah, and i think that's that's one of the things when we're talking about the thinking that goes in behind this is that a lot of the modeling and a lot of the information that comes out talks about individuals but actually we're talking about family units um which is you know the, the average size somewhere around 2.4 2.5 kind of thing uh, you know that actually when we open up the churches the practicalities that we could potentially have uh, clusters or families that are in and then distancing between them and what that might look like is actually something that is still going to be case by case depending on where your yeah. churches are based and what your what the demographic of, uh, of of your of your congregation is made up as but actually 
you you need to come up with something in the thinking that is the model for how you will proceed and what that might look like on a measure of risk against the guidance that is available at any particular time which actually picks up i've just seen we have another question from um, tony which was which was talking this about you know clumps of chairs and arrangements and i think Lauren, you mentioned it it's like you know if you've got pews in a balcony kind of thing that putting families who can sit along one line together but a few pews apart from somebody else is an appropriate use of space and is probably slightly easier to manage than loose chairs or open spaces um, but at the same time be practical think through uh, and and look at the risks to yourselves and to others um, but it goes back that we could be seeing like the online engagement is going to stay quite high for a very long time as a result of this um, and that's before we even look at what the impact might be with shared space because we have a number of churches no. um, and a lot of churches in the UK uh, are in the in the model of renting halls and renting school spaces as I'm sure they are elsewhere in the world uh, because it's practical uh, because there's often a cost benefit but at the same time we might see that those spaces aren't actually available to us um, over this next few months as they have to increase their cleaning and their shutdown times and keep their footfall to a minimum that there's potential that actually those in rented spaces in that nature might actually not be returning to physical spaces for uh, longer than those who own their own building so there's, there's plenty to take into consideration so it's we've you know it's a live thing the point is to get our thinking down now and act early to think through as many scenarios as possible so that we are communicating communicating again and when we're tired of communicating communicate some more to make sure that everybody's up on um, what we're at and how we're going to do it so that there's kind of like no surprises as we take this forward just just on that i'd, I'd add in that um obviously a number of churches sit within denominations have that discussion and it it could be that others are, are influencing your thinking but obviously you have a voice as well and you might be able to help them influence their thinking and then finally within that context is do talk to other churches in your area um because they are going through a similar thing uh, and shared thinking can help but also if, if you are mirroring each other then it, it does help this is there i can't under i can't under emphasize the psychological effects of people thinking how will i start going back to uh public spaces um and if, if churches are able to talk through a process and actually come up with um a, a plan and, and it, within slight variations uh, they are matching each other that, that you can say actually that the church in your area is, is looking at how it's intentionally starting to go back uh, and remobilize uh, and reopen in a, in a coordinated and discussed manner I think that's a very positive way uh, again very practical but a, a positive way um, to yeah. do that. and certainly for example on, on engineer visits it's going to be more attractive if you if you've got an engineer that's coming a while and you've got two, three, if you, you can visit two churches while you're here and get paid the same rate as it were, that, that's another tick box for him or her. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Over to you, Chris. Well, yeah, absolutely. And Lauren, I think it was uh, really, really helpful. So like, thank you so much for all, because I think you're just helping us think through things that I think for many pastors, they will glaze over when it comes to thinking about buildings and use of space and and so i think i think it's worth stating at this point that you know if if you're a pastor and you're watching this and you're thinking right oh, this i don't even know where to start with all this or it's just not in my skill set i you know someone starts saying health and safety or operations or buildings and my eyes just glaze over then it's worth saying at this point get someone on your team who does know about it but you don't have to you know as a pastor yeah. you don't have to do all this stuff but you do have to make sure it happens so it's making sure you get the right people around you and it um and that and that, that's something that we can certainly help on as well i mean uh, we there's some things as thinking church that that we offer um one of those things is we do a, a two-hour facilitation on any topic um and if you want to discuss around okay i need to find the right team around me to make sure that these things are thought about we can help you with that and we can spend two hours with you help you think through what are the kinds of people that you need what are the kind of people that you've got in your church we can help you figure those things out um what we also do is we also do a um we'll help you with the kind of governance side of church um and we we do it sort of on a per day price 
for that. So if you're, if you're looking at sort of looking at any of the governance side of, of, of the church, then we can certainly help you out with that. And of course, we always offer a, a one hour free con consultation. If you're just trying to figure out what on earth is going on, not quite sure where I'm at, I'm trying to think through where my church is at and thinking about the route forward, the route forward of how are we going to go back to church, then we can just spend an hour with you, help you figure those things out and get a plan in place uh, that will help you just sort of take next steps forward. Um, what you can do is you go to our website, uh, www.thinking.church. Uh, and if you click the buy now button, uh, then it will take you through to our booking page and everything's on there. The free um, one hour consultations on there that you can book in a two hour facilitation with us. And we have packages uh, that you can book in if you're looking to sort out your, your mission, your vision, your, your strategy, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, we can help you through that and it's, we've got different things for different size churches as well uh, so yeah lots and lots of things to go through and uh, lots lots of ways that we can really really help and, and we're really yeah. excited to help churches in this period I'll, I'll add in with that that if you are booking in for uh, the, the one hour consultation or two hours uh, to actually look at something in more detail and it specifically touches on health and safety the governance and operations piece uh, that we will hook up to make sure that we uh, we set a date and a time uh, for that call where we can have Lawn in there with us as well, particularly at this time, uh, to make sure we have access to uh, someone accredited and carrying uh, specific knowledge in that area. Um, and if it's the facilitation, just that the more broad brush stuff about the strategy of what that looks like, Chris and I have got ourselves available as well. So any of those calls in, dependent on the topic, we will draw on members of the team to make sure that you are served best um, and you've got every chance that your church will thrive through this period. Excellent stuff. Well, it's probably uh, worth saying that it's uh, we're about out of time, uh, but next week we'll be back uh, with a webinar. Me and Lee will be talking about the post-COVID world and um, how that looks for our, for our ministry teams. Actually, we had a question in the Q&A that just picked up on that a little bit about the win and uh, so we'll be picking up on all those kind of things about how we're going to think about online, how we're going to think about ministries, how we're going to think about uh, how this period has affected what we do. And so we'll be we'll be taking a really, uh, really deep dive into that next week. Uh, so, Lee, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure as always. And Lorne, thank you so much for joining us as well. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. You're your your large bookcase and uh, and uh, wood panelled room is um, has made us all uh, feel very inferior. So uh, thank you so <laughs> much. For it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a history collection of uh, all the the jobs that I've done, the various books that I've read or been involved in developing and stuff like that. So um, yeah, it's probably a if you scan into it, you probably do it as a bit of a CV, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well. Um, we will see you next Thursday for our next webinar and uh, it's goodbye from me and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank Thanks you. for joining guys. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye. Bye.